here at the Woodrow Wilson School. Today we are joined by uh, Olympia Snow, former Republican Senator from the great state of Maine. Senator Snow served in the U.S. Senate from 1995 to 2013 and is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1979 to 1995. In 2012, she made the very difficult decision not to seek a fourth term in the Senate because she felt that the excessive political polarization in Congress would, diminish in the sh would not diminish in the short term. She then joined the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, where she has been able to promote change from outside the institution. She co-chairs the Center's Commission on Political Reform. Elected to the Senate in 1994, Senator Snow began th became the second female senator in Maine's history earning 74% of the vote when she was last elected for a sixth term in November 2006. In the Senate, she had a reputation for building bipartisan consensus and is one of the Congress's leading moderates. In 1999, she was cited by Congressional Quarterly for her centrist leadership and was co-chair of a bipartisan consensus building group in the Senate called the Common Ground Coalition, a forum for communication and cooperation between Sem Senate Democrats and Republicans. During her time in the Senate, Senator Snow worked tirelessly on issues such as budget and fiscal responsibility, education, including student financial aid and education technology, <coughs> national security, women's issues, health care, including prescription drug coverage for Medicare patients, uh, recipients, welfare reform, oceans and fisheries issues, and, of course, campaign finance reform. In 2005, she was named the 54th most powerful woman in the world by Forbes magazine. A year later, Time magazine named her as one of the top 10 US senators. We are so incredibly fortunately, she is fortunate that she's taken time out of her very busy schedule to spend time with us, with uh, the students and faculty here. And so please join me in welcoming Senator Olympia Snow. I'd say it leaves me speechless, but I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. Um, <laughs> but I also want to thank all of you for your very generous and warm uh, reception here this afternoon. And in exchange, I promise to follow the advice that was given to me by a very wise person, said Olympia, a great speech is one with a good beginning and a good ending, which are kept very close together. <laughs> um, so I'll try to remember that. But a good beginning would be for me to say how deeply honored I am to be here. Uh, for my very first visit, by the way, at Princeton University, and uh, at one of the most highly regarded institutions on the planet, and a distinction that's only been enhanced uh, by the extraordinary leadership of your president, Christopher Iskoba, and also uh, the recognition that has been given by U.S. News and World Report once again in naming Princeton University number one. Uh, I just hope uh, that being here in the presence of a recovering politician uh, will not permanently tarnish their reputation. <laughs> but speaking of stellar reputations, Dean Rouse, uh, the Wilson School of Public and International Affairs is uh, most fortunate to have you as a leader of such caliber and depth and breadth of your experience at the helm of such of a renowned institution. Uh, with this school's enriching and empowering students uh, who go forward, I've already met so many of them, uh, who are going to influence the direction uh, of the nation, if not uh, the world. And I just want to applaud you for your laser-like focus, your emphasis uh, in your vision on service, on global perspectives, uh, and the highest quality teaching and research uh, that is so central to the mission that this school provides uh, for young people, in your own words, saying that they're going to be able to apply the skills and the knowledge that they learn here uh, to uh, solutions of vital public problems. Well, I hope uh, that you will consider running for office then, uh, because you're probably all too painfully aware that our Congress, uh, <coughs> country needs you now more than ever, uh, particularly what we're seeing unfolding in Washington. And it probably comes as no surprise, um, and you probably surmise, that I'm going to discuss this afternoon, uh, the in the essence of my remarks, of what has gone wrong in Washington, what has undermined uh, 
uh, the Congress's uh, capacity to uh, tackle monumental issues facing this country, and what can we do uh, to get Congress back on track and make government work for all of us. Uh, to paraphrase uh, William Shakespeare, um, I'm not here to praise partisanship, but I'm here to bury it. Uh, because I think that it's, it's fundamentally corrosive uh, to our system of government and certainly to our governing uh, process in Washington. I can't help but think of a story. Uh, of course, it's a main story. John Templeton would like this. Um, it's about uh, the late uh, Senator Matt Mathias, who was a moderate Republican senator from the state of Maryland, who happened to own a home uh, on an island in Maine called Isla Hope. that requires taking a ferry from the mainland uh, to the island. So one day, uh, Senator Mathias was on the ferry, and the ferry operator recognized him and said, Senator Mathias, you're Senator Mathias, aren't you? And he said, yes, I am. He said, wow. He said, uh, there must be a lot of smart people down in Washington, aren't there? And Senator Mathias said, well, yes, there are a lot of smart people in Washington. And the ferry operator said, well, and there are probably a lot of people who aren't so smart too, right? And Senator Mathias said, well, yes, I guess I would have to agree with you on that as well. And to which the ferry operator replied very quickly, and it's getting harder and harder to tell the difference. <laughs> Well, you know, I suppose, uh, you know, it was probably funny in the 70s, but perhaps not so funny now, and we're closer to reality. But there are uh, still some smart people uh, down in Washington. But unfortunately, we're witnessing fewer and fewer examples of those who are willing uh, to work across the political aisle. Now, I have to tell you, it was an extraordinary privilege uh, to have been able uh, to serve the people of Maine and to have their trust vested in me. Uh, for more than 34 years in serving in both the House and Senate. And it isn't every day that someone or, you know, relinquishes one or 100 seats in the United States Senate. So, you know, when I made the decision uh, in my announcement not to seek re-election to the United States Congress, it obviously sent shockwaves uh, through my own state of Maine, as well as through the political, establish uh, uh, political establishment in Washington. Uh, because uh, I had been working for the better part of two years, organizationally and financially, uh, to position myself uh, for the next election. But as I drew nearer to the time in which I had to submit my signatures, um, it became a clarifying moment. As I traveled the country, people would pose two questions uh, to me. They would say, and I was raising money for my re-election, they would say, is, is Congress going to change and how is it going to change? Well, you know, I started to ponder that. And I began to realize uh, the reality. And unfortunately, I recognize that the polarization and the partisanship would not be diminished in the short term. So I decided uh, to take my fight for bipartisanship outside of the institution and fight in a different direction. Because I realized that the change would not come uh, from within the institution itself. As I said at the time, um, I wasn't leaving because I no longer loved the institution or that I no longer believed in its potential, but precisely uh, because I do. And so I made you know, a very wrenching decision. Uh, but at the time, I realized uh, with the kind of partisanship that it was unfolding, that if anything, it wouldn't change. And the question is whether it would get worse. And ordinarily, I would enjoy being right, but not under these circumstances. Uh, Norm Ornstein, who's a noted congressional observer, wrote in the last Congress, he said, you know, people always say this was the worst Congress ever. He said, but this time they are right. And he and a co-author, Thomas Mann, uh, wrote a book, It's Worse Than It Looks. Well, you know, it did get worse uh, because of Congress's perilous inertia and inaction uh, that led us to this point. Uh, where it has really put our future uh, in jeopardy. If you think about you know, all of the issues that are certainly piling up in Congress's legislative inbox, uh, ranging from you know, budget deficits to entitlement reform, and Medicare and Social Security and strengthening them for the future, or for immigration reform, none of which uh, have been addressed over the last uh, four years. And when you think about the question of you know, fundamentally, how is we as Americans going to achieve our fullest potential? 
uh, in, our, in our nation to achieve uh, its fullest potential. Then obviously you have to have a Congress and a president that are working together in concert on the key issues uh, that matters. Uh, we cannot possibly transcend the hyper-partisanship uh, that exists today um, and govern our country um, and come to grips with the key issues that are fundamental uh, to security and to prosperity, both nationally and internationally. When you think about all of the issues that have been left you know, unsettled and undone, compounded by the looming threat of the terrorist uh, group ISIS, uh, both in Iraq and Syria and beyond. Um, clearly, that is a question that should have compelled Congress, for example, uh, to have stayed in uh, more than they did in order to debate uh, these questions as to what exactly our strategy should be uh, going into the future. But rather, they spent the better part of six hours in the House of Representatives debating whether or not to train uh, the moderate Syrian rebels, um, and five hours in the world's greatest deliberative body uh, in the United States Senate. Why? Because uh, they were anxious uh, to adjourn uh, for their re-election campaigns. Now, mind you, having just returned from a five-week recess, uh, both in July and in August, to return in September and barely remain in session for a better part of eight days. Now, just to put this in, in context, in one of my re-elections in 2000, um, I, we were still in session the Wednesday before the election. In fact, I well recall it because um, I was uh, driving from the Capitol after our last vote back to my apartment to get my suitcases to return uh, to Maine, and I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I could not believe that I was still in Washington, D.C. with my name on the ballot uh, on the following Tuesday. But the gravity of the circumstances uh, demanded that we stay in Washington and complete and fulfill our functions, uh, which of course in this instance happened to be negotiating a budget agreement. But today I'm concerned about the fact that uh, legislating is sort of being viewed as an antiquated practice. I mean, to place the deficiency of this Congress in, in, into context, the last Congress in which I was sitting, and by the way, the last vote that I cast was on New Year's Day at two o'clock uh, in the morning to avert the fiscal cliff crisis. So that just uh, illustrates, you know, how badly broken uh, the system was. But the last Congress was described as the least productive since 1947. And in 1947, that Congress was labeled by President Truman as the do-nothing Congress. And that Congress uh, enacted 906 laws. The last Congress, the 112th, enacted 283 laws. And this Congress to date has enacted only 165 laws. Now, one of the leading authorities on uh, elections in politics, Charlie Cook, wrote a <coughs> column in July, and he talked about how and one of his friends was saying, well, you know, everybody says this is the worst Congress, but actually it was back in the ninth Congress in 1805 when Congress had no money after the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, if you have to go back, you know, that far in the fledgling years of our nation, then you know uh, we have a problem. As Jimmy Fallon, you know, interestingly described it, he said, well, he said, you know, Congress for the first time is being broadcast live on Facebook. Now you can uh, waste time and not get work done watching Congress uh, waste time and not get work done. <laughs> um, you know, the former governor and current senator uh, from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, was interviewed in Time Magazine a couple of months ago. And he said that he'd never been in a less productive time uh, in his life than now in the United States Senate. He said, you know, my worst day as a governor uh, was better than my best day as a United States Senator. So what does that tell you about the institution of the United States Senate being virtually irrelevant? I mean, and when you think about the context of, you know, in which our founding fathers had designed the institution to be 
uh, a refuge from the passion of politics uh, where political fires are tempered uh, and not stoked. Uh, but regrettably, we have far departed uh, from the purpose you know, of the United States Senate being the greatest deliberative body. It was predicated on majority rule, but it also accommodated the rights of the minority by sorting through the issues. So the American people understand instinctively uh, that something's gone terribly wrong. 71% uh, believe that America you know, is moving in the wrong direction. 76% uh, of Americans believe uh, that their children will not be better off than they are. And you know, this is the first time in a country where one generation doesn't believe the next generation uh, will be better off. And in fact, the Washington Post you know, reported not too long ago that we've hit 10 historic, uh, Congress has hit 12 historic lows since 2010 uh, in terms of its low public <laughs> approval rating. And in fact, uh, at the end of my tenure in Congress, we were at about 10% approval rating. And it prompted one of uh, my former colleagues to say at the time, well, I wonder who that 10% is that thinks that Congress is doing a good job. It uh, probably doesn't even account for family and friends, but however, <laughs> root canals were even uh, more popular. And that's why, you know, when I departed the Senate, um, I did uh, have been traveling the country, uh, reassuring Americans, one, that yes, you know, we can bridge the partisan divide and we can defeat the machinery of partisanship because people express to me their frustration and anger, you know, about the direction of Congress, its inability uh, to work across the political aisle to do what's right in the best interest of this country. And it's the reason why I also wrote, um, when I departed the Senate, a book, which frankly surprised me more uh, than my decision not to seek re-election uh, to the Senate. Um, as somebody once said, it's fun to have written a book, it's not fun to write a book. And I can truly attest to that. Uh, but I did write the book, Fighting for Common Ground, because I wanted to describe uh, how Congress uh, worked in the Senate specifically, because it is truly important to understand uh, that we do have the ability to change the system and return it uh, to the way in which our founding fathers originally envisioned. When I left the Senate, I immediately joined uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, where I'm a senior fellow. And the Bipartisan Policy Center it was co-founded by four former majority leaders, two Democrats and two Republicans, Senator Mitchell, Senator Daschle, Senator Dole, and Senator Baker. And for the last year and a half, I um, co-chaired the Commission on Political Reform. And our purpose was to investigate the causes and consequences of the political polarization, but more specifically, to develop targeted proposals about how we could break uh, the stalemate in Congress. And there were 29 of us um, who served on the Commission of All Political Stripes, um, passionate viewpoints on both sides of the political aisle, mostly you know, former you know, office holders, uh, but those from academia, from nonprofits, uh, from um, nonprofit uh, foundations, but also from the military, um, and across all sectors, essentially, of society and our economy. And our uh, commission was co-chaired by four uh, by five of us, um, two former uh, majority leaders, Senator Trent Lott and Senator Daschle, a, a Republican and a Democrat, former Secretary of Agriculture and Congressman um, Dan Gluckman, and former Secretary of Interior, uh, Senator and Governor Dirk Kempthorn. Among the five of us who co-chaired the commission, we represented um, the collective 120 years of public service uh, in the United States Congress over the last four decades. Uh, we can attest to the fact uh, that there was never a golden era of bipartisanship in the United States Congress, but we also witnessed the heights to which Congress could rise when people were willing uh, to work across the aisle determined uh, to solve a problem. And so we developed this report with 65 recommendations. Uh, you'll be relieved to know I'm not going to go through all of them. I will focus later in my remarks on a few of them that I think are consequential and they could help to break uh, the deadlock and stalemate uh, in Congress. But our intention is not to have our report gather dust. So commissioners are fanning across the country, speaking on college campuses, on, at public policy institutes and organizations of all kinds and political persuasion. 
to engage Americans uh, for our cause. Also working on Capitol Hill, working uh, with staff, uh, with members of Congress in both the House and Senate to begin the process of trying to get some of the institutional changes that we are recommending. Because one key day does occur at the beginning of each new Congress, and that is the opening day, the first Tuesday in January, where, when each House uh, adopts the rules that will govern the proceedings of that Congress. And so it's important, if we're going to get any of the rules changes uh, that can make it um, you know, a, a session where it will be more collaborative, more cooperative, it can make a profound difference in how the process works and that ultimately the policies that arise from it. So we're very much focused between now and the beginning of next year to get some of the changes that I'll discuss in a moment that I think are critically important and which ones that we have agreed to. It's a blueprint for transformational change. It gets people who are frustrated and angry a means to channel that frustration in a constructive <coughs> and effective way. And these are empowering actions where people can feel empowered to do something about changing the system. And that moment cannot come uh, too soon. There was a Pew survey uh, just shortly after we released our recommendations in June. And it indicated where the people who are consistently liberal or consistently conservative have risen, have doubled that in fact, uh, from 10 to 21% over the last 20 years. Uh, but that there are 80% that essentially are sort of in the middle. They may be on the right or the left, uh, but believe in compromise and consensus. And as the Pew survey indicated, you know, then unfortunately there are too many people who are standing, in their words, on, on the sidelines, uh, distant and disengaged, while the ideologically oriented and the politically rancorous, uh, the ones that are, you know, involved in, in making sure that their voices are heard uh, and participating at greater levels at every stage of the political process. Uh, again, in their words. And that's the point. Each and every one of us have an obligation uh, to make sure that this political system as we know it today is an aberration and not a norm. And that's why we have a short-term window. Now is the election. We have an opportunity to do something about it using our voices and, and using our vote. Now you may be thinking, well, you know, that's easy enough to say, but believe me when I tell you uh, that it hasn't always been this way. It doesn't have to be this way and that we definitely can make it change. Uh, last week I was asked at a forum um, whether or not what we are facing today is different from what has occurred in the past um, and can we learn from history? And I say emphatically yes to both questions. Uh, yes, you know, there was disagreements uh, in the past. In fact, you know, people say, well, you know, the 1800s, it was really bad, you know, they had brawls and disagreements and canings and so forth. And I said, well, is that the standard by which we want to establish uh, for the United States Senate or the U.S. Congress overall? Hopefully we've politically matured uh, since that time and moved on. Uh, but the point is, is that these disagreements become just that. They remain so and are taken to the next election. Uh, in my second term in the House of Representatives, President Reagan had assumed, you know, uh, you know, a triple calamity, both in the Iranian hostage-taking crisis uh, to an energy crisis and, of course, a plummeting economy that resulted in 20, 21 percent prime interest rates. So he had to work with a Democratic House of Representatives. And, of course, at that time, it was Speaker Tip O'Neill. Now, you know, they weren't uh, politically, philosophically compatible, but they made it work because they understood that it was about the greater good of the country. And so, yes, while they had their disagreements, and they were fierce ones at that, at the end of the day, they were able to resolve their differences. And I was part of a coalition in the House of Representatives at the time when uh, President Reagan was trying to you know, engineer a uh, budget agreement for, for an economic recovery. And I was part of what was called the Gypsy Moss, and that was the Northeast Republicans, and then it was the Bow Weevils, the Southern Democrats. I'll leave it to you to decide why they were naming us after insects, but in any event, <laughs> it worked. Um, and we brokered an agreement. No, not to say that it was perfect. Obviously, it wasn't. 
But the point is, it moved the process forward because President Reagan understood that he had to work with the Democratic uh, House of Representatives and Speaker Tip O'Neill accommodated that as well. And so during the day, they would have their disagreements. At night, you know, they would have their meetings and their dinners, and they moved the process forward. President George H.W. Bush, I mean, he paid a political price for brokering a budget agreement uh, in 1990 during the time of the recession on the issue of taxes. And as he wrote in his diary uh, that he was not going to fall on his ideological sword and not have the country move forward. And he understood that it might mean a one-term uh, presidency. Uh, President Clinton, you know, had to work with a Republican Congress, an occurrence that, you know, hadn't been since uh, the early 1950s. Uh, so he understood, and he believed in what was called triangulation, the shaking out positions between Democrats and Republicans. He talked about balanced budget, and welfare reform, and tax reform. In fact, um, it, he met, cited all of these issues in his State of the Union address and it prompted former President Reagan to say that was tantamount to grand larceny. Uh, the, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But the President Clinton worked with the Republican Congress, and ultimately it yielded results, balanced budgets and surpluses for the first time since the 1930s. Uh, in the aftermath of the Bush-Gore uh, election and the decision was rendered by the Supreme Court, it was a contentious time in the Senate. And we were now a 50-50 Senate with a tie being broken by the Vice President. And I was co-chairing the centrist coalition with the Democrat, uh, John uh, Bro from uh, Louisiana. And we had about you know, 30, 35 senators uh, attend a meeting where we invited the majority leader, Senator Lott and Senator Daschle, uh, to the meeting and to ensure uh, that bipartisanship was alive and well and that we did not want to see the legislative process derailed in any fashion. We want to move forward. And in fact, in less than six months, uh, President Bush was able to get his, uh, the largest tax cut in history at a time in which we were trying to avoid a recession and shortly before the catastrophic events of 9-11. The point of all of this is, is that these are examples, you know, of, you know, bipartisan partnerships which are crucial, if not indispensable, uh, to the legislative process. You know, as what someone once said, bipartisanship is not a political theory, um, it is a political necessity. And, you know, frankly, uh, in recognizing that truism throughout my whole tenure, I, you know, had determined that I would always try um, to do the right thing, what I believe to be right on particular policies, to work across the political aisle, and to be a so-called legislative lone ranger if necessary. And there are times in which I was the predictive vote, the swing vote, the determining vote on some critical issues as a member of the Senate Finance Committee, whether it was on Social Security, on Medicare, or on taxes. And um, at the time that I served in the Finance Committee, um, Senator Grassley from Iowa was the ranking member and previously had been chair when we were in the majority. In any event, one day I happened to be uh, in the cloakroom, which is a room off the Senate floor, and I was on the telephone, and um, Senator Grassley came by, and he put out his hand, and he opened it up, and then sitting in the palm of his hand were a pile of pills. And he said, do you see these, Olympia? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, uh, you're the reason I take these. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sort of apologized. I said, I'm sorry I'm giving you so many headaches, because uh, I was giving, you know, my Republican colleagues a few you know, uh, instances of heartburn. So it wasn't uh, about a little while later, uh, Senator Grassley then became ranking member of Judiciary Committee to be succeeded on the Finance Committee by Senator Orrin Hatch. So I ran into Senator Grassley one day and I said, uh, Chuck, by the way, what did you do with those pills? He said, I gave them to Orrin Hatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, bipartisan uh, collaborations, you know, are rare today. Uh, probably as rare as solar eclipses, or if not Haley's Comets. Um, and which is, you know, unfortunate because I think we're seeing the net result, you know, of what happens when you don't have the kind of cooperation that's so vital uh, to uh, our political system and to making divided government work. Uh, 
um, because at the end of the day, that is precisely uh, what is required in Washington, is making divided government work and the willingness uh, to work uh, on the other side. Everett Dirksen, who was the minority leader of the United States Senate and was a partner to President Johnson, you know, in enacting uh, the Civil Rights Act um, in 1964, you know, said, he said, I live by my principles. And one of my principles is flexibility. Um, and, you know, and that's precisely it. Because you have to understand that, you know, you're not going to get 100% of what you want, that the other side might have some good ideas, and you have to respect differing viewpoints. But today, in the legislating process in Washington, they virtually abandoned the process of actually legislating. And it's devolved into a, a series of gutcha votes. It's all about leveraging one side to the detriment of the other. Uh, it obviously embraces all or nothing my way of the highway strategies, a scorched earth approach uh, to legislating. And it's not designed to appeal to, uh, you know, uh, designing the best policies for the country, but rather targeted to the political base, to ideological interests, to raising money, or to being enshrined in the 30 second sound bites uh, that are going to be running in the next election because it becomes all about the next election. And ordinarily, uh, the first year after an election is when the legislative body would concentrate on the key issues uh, and we generally agree on what the governing agenda would be. But unfortunately, that is not the case today. Um, it's all about positioning for the next election, so it becomes a perpetual campaign and perpetuating the extreme position. So all of the votes, all of the positions, any of the votes you know, that are shaped and framed, and the messaging, because it's all about messaging today, sending messages, but it's not about framing the, the right policies, is about appealing to that political base all designed for the next election. So it's no wonder then we have been lurching from one self-engineered crisis after another. If you think about over the last few years, it's all been, all been about self-designed uh, events by the United States Congress. It's responding uh, to their inactions in the final moments that creates uh, uncertainty and fear uh, in terms of what they're capable or not capable of doing. Uh, obviously, the most notable event was the debt ceiling uh, uh, debacle of 2011 when it brought you know, America to the precipice. I mean, it was the highest levels of financial and political brinkmanship. And it was the 11th hour in which they finally, and we finally re resolved our differences when we had a better part of six months in which to effect a change. We had all six months to work up to that moment. In fact, the deadline kept moving in terms of when the Treasury would run out of money. But unfortunately, it was brought up to what I call the high noon at the OK Corral moment. Uh, because it has an effect on the political base, and that's what it um, becomes. And that triggered the first ever downgrade of our AAA credit rating. Uh, that, you know, cost the taxpayers $20 billion, according to the Bipartisan Policy Center, over the next uh, 10 years. It induced the highest levels of policy uncertainty, according to three economists, of any events that had transpired over the last uh, 20 and 25 years. And it spawned First, a super committee that was comprised of 12 members of the House and the Senate, and they were charged with, you know, phenomenal responsibilities like tax reform, entitlement reform, long-term debt reduction, all to be accomplished, by the way, in 90 days. Well, obviously, it was designed to fail, and it did, which spawned the automatic cuts, otherwise known as sequestration, which indiscriminately cut across the board without regard as to whether or not programs were working and not working. And the reason, you know, it took Congress two and a half years to replace those automatic cuts this year on something they never agreed to, they never supported to begin with. When those automatic cuts were designed as a result of that debt ceiling uh, fiasco in 2011, both sides thought the other would blink. And they, neither side did. And so ultimately, those automatic cuts stood, stood, stood in place for two and a half years, all because we didn't have a budget. The last three years uh, in the United States Senate, of my tenure, uh, we never considered a budget. Imagine the largest economy in the world, 
operating without a budget, but that's true. And in fact, they finally had a budget uh, resolution brought up before the Senate and the House last year. And in fact, the new Congress passed what was called no budget, no pay. And that was true to a point. Um, that each if the, each chamber didn't pass a budget, then they wouldn't be paid. But it did address the question as to whether or not that budget became law, which it's required to do by April 15th. And that's why I promote in my book the idea of having making no budget, no pay permanent. Because if Congress can't pass a budget on time, then they certainly shouldn't get paid. I mean, because it's one of the most basic obligations a member of Congress has. And it has enormous implications when the Congress cannot pass a budget. And they passed budget resolutions last year, but it was like two ships passing in the night, one in the Atlantic and one in the Pacific. You know, because they're separated by light years philosophically on keystone issues, whether it's on entitlements, whether it's on taxes, whether it's the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and so rather than trying to work through those differences and go to conference, as normally would be the case, uh, they decided to lock down and to retrench and retreat into their ideological foxholes. Well, that has a material impact on the economy. And not to mention, uh, it triggered a 16-day shutdown. Now, if Congress had passed the 12 appropriation bills, there would not have been a shutdown. They had done their jobs. But last year, for the second consecutive year, the United States Senate passed zero out of the 12 appropriation bills. And the House had passed four, none of which, of course, became law. Now, if some of those bills had become law, then the corresponding agency would have been functioning during the time of the shutdown. And again, if they had passed all 12, then the government could not have been shut down. You could not have had, the group in the House of Representatives would not have had the leverage because the government would have been operating because Congress did its job in passing the appropriation bills by the beginning of the fiscal year. Well, you would have thought they wouldn't want to put America through additional turmoil and trauma, but that wasn't to be the case. But they demonstrated again and again and again their preference for operating the country by delay, default, and deferral. I sort of liken it to being the captain of the Titanic, you know, manufacturing an iceberg to hit over and over again, because that's precisely what's happened. And of course, you know, in Congress has manufactured gross levels of uncertainty, because there's been a wall on so many issues for so long that are really core uh, to the issues that we're confronting today on economic mobility and opportunity. The Federal Reserve of Philadelphia issued a paper in July speaking to the very question of the impact of partisanship you know, on a lackluster economic recovery. I mean, it's resulted in the worst post-recession recovery in, in our history. And as the author noted in that paper, that the political disagreements, uh, in her words, uh, exacerbated the detrimental effects of the slow recovery uh, since the Great Recession. And so what are the implications of that? Well, the Congressional Budget Office revised the economic projections downward uh, this year uh, from 3.1% 3, 3 to 1.5%, so half of what it was. And so that has enormous ramifications uh, throughout uh, the economy. It reverberates, I mean, and that's why, you know, frankly, you have, you know, the Federal Reserve, you know, filling a vacuum over the last few years in the absence of fiscal policy, uh, you know, on the part of the United States Congress. I mean. You know, Chairman Bernanke at the time would come before the Finance Committee, come before a myriad of committees in the House and Senate begging for Congress to adopt a fiscal policy, adopt a budget, adopt long-term debt reduction. And of course, there was no action on the part of Congress, and they filled that vacuum with the bond purchasing and now the zero interest rates. It all creates this lingering uncertainty about the future because there are no ground rules by which the private sector can operate, can invest, create jobs, and make the economy grow and to expand the economic pie. And now, you know, as the, uh, the current chair of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, said not too long ago, she talked about the fact that there are too many people who are, you know, without a job uh, but cannot find them, and that there are people who are working part-time, who would like to work full-time, but can't because those jobs aren't available, and that there are people who are totally discouraged and would look for a job if the labor market was stronger. Exactly, and that's the point. I mean, the labor market has actually fallen in the size of the labor market for two consecutive months, according to the Wall Street Journal. I mean, it's the lowest number of employed 
in over 36 years. And so that, you know, has a tremendous impact, you know, on upward mobility, on, on jobs, on wage growth. I mean, it's no wonder we have income inequality. Uh, it's as great as since the 1920s. And, you know, you read the stories about how the middle income, uh, you know, class is, you know, not growing compared to other countries in terms of size, the benefit, because the benefits, you know, are not being shared across our economy. And so it's no wonder when people are asked the question, as they were in a recent poll, as to whether or not they felt uh, that, you know, they, we were still in a recession. And 49% said yes, because they're feeling the direct effect. I mean, there's a correlation by the lack of action in Congress on the key issues that matter that will help to make investments in the future. And in fact, according to analysis by economist uh, Douglas Holtz Egan, who was actually uh, did his, received his PhD here at Princeton uh, University, did an analysis of economic growth. And he said that if the post-World War II rate of expansion uh, occurred at 3.3%, you know, over 30 years, your salary could double. But at the current rate of economic growth, of, you know, projected by the CBO of 1.5%, of then it would take 93 years uh, to double your salary. So obviously, that does you know, you know, affect our standard of living in, in America. It affects the standard of living for all Americans. It sets us back uh, because we're not creating the kind of jobs and making the kind of investments uh, to expand the economy that benefits more Americans. As he further noted in his analysis, which I think is critically important, is that if, you know, economic growth is 3.5% over the next 10 years, you're talking about 2.5 million additional jobs. You know, if it's 3%, it's 1.2 million. And so it makes a profound difference about the economic growth, uh, you know, that we're, you know, experiencing today compared to what the historical norms were. And that's why it is so critical for Congress to take actions on these fundamental issues. It matters because it also is in terms of our debt and the level of debt. We're in uncharted waters. Today, we're 74% of our uh, debt represents 74% of the gross domestic product. That's twice of what it was um, at the end of 2008. So it's, uh, it's doubled. And by uh, 2024, it will be 77%. In 25 years, 100%. And you know, these are areas, as the CBO has noted, uh, that we haven't experienced since World War II, at the end of World War II. But that was a time which, you know, we owned our own debt. But now we have bond holders that let us to invest in buying our debt. Uh, so it puts us in a far more precarious position. So albeit the de deficits are coming down today, the long-term debt is troubling, uh, and it's certainly not sustainable. And we have 77 million Americans who will be retiring over the next 10 years. And over the next 20 years, at, at a rate of 10,000 a day, and what does that portend for our entitlement programs such as Social Security and Medicare? Well, 85% of the increases in government spending will be attributed to Medicare, Social Security, to Medicaid, health care programs, and interest payments on the debt, which, by the way, will triple. Will triple. Interest payments on the debt will triple over the next 10 years from, you know, $230 billion to essentially $800 billion. Uh, that's tremendous because that's obviously going to have enormous credit implications down the road. So it's, you know, it's unacceptable that we're at this point. America deserves better than what we're getting and certainly not the lowest common denominator leadership and governance that ultimately is producing uh, the kind of lagging economy <coughs> that's impacting most Americans. Alan Simpson, who a uh, former senator from Wyoming, said, you know, um, if you can't learn to compromise without compromising your principles. Uh, you shouldn't get, you shouldn't go to Congress and you shouldn't get married. Because, <laughs> and you know, it's a, certainly a basic truth. Uh, and there's some realism to all of that, but the bottom line is, as we all know, it's about working uh, to make things better. And the one thing that we have to, you know, primarily focus on is not to institutionalize a scorched earth approach uh, to legislate, because there's only two outcomes. It's either scorched earth division on one side or political stagnation. 
And so people ask me, well, how did it get this way? Well, there are many reasons that can be attributed to the, polar the polarization and the rise of partisanship in today's political system. But you know, the red states are obviously getting red and the blue states are getting bluer. We see it you know, denoted in a, in a number of examples. Um, in 1987, uh, there were 57 senators uh, who uh, represented one party, but their states uh, voted for the presidential candidate of the opposing party. Today, there are only 21 uh, senators who are in that category in the United States Senate. So what it tells you is there's no incentive to working across the aisle because it incurs the risk of a primary challenge. So everybody is both, you know, focused on getting a primary rather than worrying about the broader electorate. More troubling is the National Journal analysis of, you know, voting um, trends of members of Congress, uh, which they began back in 1982. And in 1982, there were 58 senators who came be between the most conservative Democrat and the most liberal Republican. In other words, there were 58 senators who occupied uh, the middle ground. Uh, today, for the fourth year in a row, the fifth time ever, the number of senators who fall into that category is literally zero. In the House of Representatives, in 1982, there were 344 uh, members of the House that regularly would cross the aisle and work on a bipartisan basis. Uh, today, there are four out of 434. So it gives you, I think, an idea of the extent to which uh, the polarization has taken hold in the legislating uh, process. Um, so it's no wonder then that uh, three political scientists, uh, based on their studies, noted that we are at the highest levels of polarization since the end of Reconstruction in 1879. And the fact is, they said you can't even measure further increases uh, because it's literally gone off the charts uh, to show you the extent to which uh, the partisanship has taken hold and manifested itself uh, in Congress uh, today. You know, um, when I was in the Senate in my final years, I often threatened to go to the floor and to conduct a refresher course on how a bill becomes law. Uh, like in Schoolhouse Rock, you know, that you introduce a bill, maybe works on it, marks it up, amends it, and so forth, because that's virtually not what's happening. In fact, um, in my last month in the Senate, uh, it didn't really, in early December, uh, the two leaders of the Senate decided uh, that they would invite members of the Senate and their spouses and staff to a preview of the movie Lincoln. Uh, they scheduled the, pre uh, the screening. Uh, in the visitor center um, in the Capitol. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, you know, what does that say when you're looking to Hollywood for a dose of reality? I mean, you know, you're really in trouble. I mean, here we are, you know, surrounded by all of this history. We're not inspired by it, uh, regrettably. Uh, but so the question really is, um, you know, where do we go from here? And, you know, and frankly, you know, what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we're a representative democracy, and we get the government we demand. If we demand bipartisanship and consensus, uh, then we'll get it. And that means you have to reward those who are willing to work across the aisle and, and penalize those who don't. And now you have an election coming up, so you can demand accountability from those candidates who are running for office. And you certainly should do it when it is a presidential campaign as well in 2016 and demanding accountability of those who are running for office and how are they going to make the system work. You can't have a legislative and executive branch working, you know, as parallel universes. You know, they have to intersect. They have to work together. So we have to demand it. All of the incentives in today's political system now are towards division and towards extremism. And so we have to be a counterweight uh, to those forces. That's why I joined the Bipartisan Policy Center, and that's why we're working on these initiatives. And I'll ask you to go to our website, bipartisanpolicy.org. But some of the recommendations that we are proposing is, for example, on filibuster reform. And we had the two leaders, uh, Senator Lott and Senator Daft, to go to the Hill and talk to the respective leaders in the Senate, the majority leader, the minority leader, and inform them of our you know, proposal, which was, um, that there would not be a filibuster on the motion to proceed to bring up a bill 
could have a filibuster on the bill itself, but not on bringing, actually bringing the bill up for debate <coughs> on the floor of the Senate, provided that 10 amendments are allowed. You know, this is a confidence building measure. You've got to start someplace. I mean, the Senate's an open, it's supposed to be an open, deliberative process, but virtually no amendments are being offered. In fact, Minari's only voted on 11 amendments, uh, since uh, on their amendment since a year ago, July. And in fact, uh, you know, even on the Democratic side, there was one Democratic senator who said, you know, he had had ten, one amendment voted on in his six years, in his six year term. I mean, that's just so how little is happening on, on the floor of the Senate. And the same is true, you know, in the House of Representatives. So we've got to get back and restoring the process through filibuster reform and setting a floor of 10 amendments that would be offered. Um, and obviously not having that as a ceiling. Uh, secondly, we should restore the committee process, make it work again, uh, and uh, get the rank and file involved in the drafting of the legislation rather than centralizing the development of legislation in the hands of leadership and putting it out there for a vote up or down. If it doesn't prevail, take it to the next election. It's become more like a parliamentary system than a deliberative process and consensus building. Um, the president, you know, should be meeting on a regular basis like monthly with the bipartisan leadership and bicameral leadership uh, because that's essential to communications, opening the lines of communication that is critically important uh, to the legislative process. Uh, that there should be joint party caucuses. You know, Democrats and Republicans should meet together at least on a monthly basis within the Senate, within the House. Uh, today we had, you know, separate meetings, everything's separate. There are lunches every day. You know, the Republicans have their lunch, the Democrats have our lunch. We could even have a farewell dinner on a bipartisan basis to those <laughs> who are departing the Senate. I mean, that's how badly it's broken down. I mean, seriously. I mean, so we've got to get, get back to, to working with one another, talking to one another. Uh, they should have a five day work week. Um, and frankly, because, and that's very basic, because currently they're barely in session every week. And in fact, uh, I think this year, 112 days for one body and 110 for the other, literally. I mean, if there aren't votes, they're not there. Yeah, you know, and obviously it's important to be home in your, in your district or your state. You know, I was home all the time in Maine. But there's a way of focusing your schedule so you get some work done and focusing on the complex issue. And besides, get to know your colleagues. I mean, there was an article not too long ago where you know, one of the House members standing next to another member didn't recognize that person as being a member of the House of Representatives. But, you know, and I know it happens, it's a large institution, but to become more familiar, you know, with your colleagues, because that builds rapport, and that is essential. Um, and so we think that that is important. So, you know, having a five-day work week, because currently, right now, Monday night, they have a bed check vote, so it gets everybody back in town. And then by Thursday, everybody's smelling jet fumes to leave town uh, to go wherever they're going, whether it's home or elsewhere, uh, you know, possibly to raise money because that is obviously uh, time consuming as well as you can imagine. So those are the kind of changes uh, that we're advocating. We think that they can be embraced and adopted in, in the rules changes at the opening day of the new session in January. We're also um, asking people to look at our website of Citizens for Political Reform Movement because we're trying to build a national movement where people can go and to focus on some recommendations that people can implement, such as open primaries and redistricting commissions uh, so that we can get away from the single party gerrymandering. We are now primaries are becoming outsized and playing a disproportionate role you know, in our political system today. Really, those who are elected in the primary are basically the ones who are gonna serve in both the House and Senate. And so we need to broaden the participation, but we've also gotta make sure that these seats aren't gerrymandered and broaden the, the you know, people uh, voting in these primaries that will be more reflective of the general population, having more independence, being able to vote. The turnout rate on average for a midterm election, which is this one, is about 18 or 20% over the last 20 years. I mean, that's it. That's it. So basically, we're allowing a very small percentage of the population dictating the future of this country. That's the bottom line. So all I can tell you is silence is not golden, OK? Because we, we've got to speak up. And don't underestimate the power of your voice. Use it, please. 
I mean, communicate, not only just in elections, but through the year demanding accountability, because that's what it's all about. And people ask me, you know, all the time, well, you know, how did the universal background check not prevail in the United States Senate when 90% of the American people supported it? I said, because it's about that 10%. Now, you know, politicians need incentives, and you give them incentives. Now, for example, you know, with those automatic cuts I was discussing earlier, well, last year, just when they were about to trigger, uh, they were going on recess. And there had been a slowdown of thousands of flights across the country because there were cutbacks in air traffic controllers because of these automatic cuts, and FAA was being cut back. Well, I'll tell you. Congress moved in nanoseconds. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't want to be sitting in those idling, idling planes on the tarmac with angry constituents and the pilots saying this is due to congressional budget cuts. So they, <laughs> you know, they changed that very quickly. Yeah. And that's the point. That's the leverage that you have as well. And we have to return our system to the one that was envisioned by our founding fathers uh, to make, you know, it's how our country was founded. And that's why, you know, I am so passionate about changing the tenor because, yes, it has been different and we can make it different again. So I urge you, you know, to weigh in right now, you know, in this election. I have formed Olympia's List because I'm helping to support some of the candidates, particularly on my side of the aisle, especially in primaries, uh, to have more centrist-based uh, candidates, those who are consensus builders. We've got to give them support because there are a number of people in the House and Senate who want to make the system work. They need the support. They need the support from the outside. Uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, the late Senator Warren Rudman once said, you know, politics is too important to be left to the politician. And he's so right. That's absolutely right. And so that's why, I, you know, I would urge each and every one of you to make sure that you're communicating. And for the students here, I should tell you that uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center has worked in conjunction with the Millennial Group, two students who founded Common Sense Action and setting, has set up 40 chapters, 21 states on college campuses. And it was formed by millennials, for millennials, uh, to repair the political system for millennial mobility and for economic opportunities, uh, and uh, working together uh, to register millennials to vote in this election, uh, but also has an agenda. And it's called Age, you know, it's an agenda for generational equity. And talking about the things that matter for the future, like debt reduction, uh, that has a material impact on your futures and the level of debt that's been accumulated. So I urge you to look at our website and hopefully you can establish a chapter here uh, as well because your participation is vital, uh, if not indispensable to the future of our country. Our country was founded on compromise, as, as you well know. Our founding fathers were not um, shrinking violets. They were deeply opinionated. Um, they argued about many matters, uh, petty and consequential. Uh, but at the end, they recognized the enormity and the gravity of their circumstances uh, necessitated uh, the courage of consensus building uh, to create the most you know, in ingenious document the world has ever known and the greatest democracy in the world. So thank you.